Story 4, Part 1 of Four Science Fiction Stories by G. L. Vandenberg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Observers, Part 1. This story was first published in Amazing Stories, November 1959. A job as laboratory technician with the Army Weapons Development Center carried about as much prestige as a bat boy in a World Series. George Fisher was a laboratory technician. He was a shy but likable fellow, a diligent worker and trustworthy. He didn't talk. He was rarely talked to. He had no burning ambition to push himself ahead in the world. Being an assistant to the brains was good enough for him. He had a commendable talent for minding his own business. In a security job, these qualities counted ahead of scientific knowledge. One day, George Fisher turned up dead. The initial shock and concern experienced by his superiors was soon overcome by the coroner's finding. Suicide. Harry Payne was the civilian personnel director of Fort Dixon. It was his job to find a replacement for George Fisher. "'Miss Conway!' Harry's voice lashed into the intercom. There was an interminable pause. He cursed under his breath. Then, "'Yes, Mr. Payne?' "'Where the hell were you? Never mind. Bring me the file on George Fisher.' "'George Fisher?' Miss Conway was in her favorite state of mind. Confusion. "'But he's dead, isn't he?' Harry let out a deep, anguished groan. "'Yes, Miss Conway, he's dead. That's why I want his file. That answer your question?' "'Yes, sir. Be there in a jiffy.' Harry could tell she was bubbling over with smiles as she spoke. A few more centuries would pass, he thought, before they manufactured another broad as dumb as Miss Conway. He stuffed his hands in his pockets and looked out the window. Across the parade ground he could see the Army Weapons Development Center. He had no idea what new bomb they might be working on behind those heavily guarded fences. He didn't care. He was only concerned with the people who worked there. The rest of Fort Dixon used mostly civil service personnel, but the barricaded security jungle across the parade grounds was more particular about its hired help. A person's record had to be spotless almost from the day of his conception, or a person could not even gain entrance. Harry had never been inside weapons development. He had once been to traffic court as a roaring juvenile eighteen years before. That was enough to bar him from even visiting. He realized, though, that the Army couldn't afford to take chances. Hiring new technicians required an arduous screening process. Harry loathed it. He was thankful that the personnel at Weapons Development were highly paid and usually permanent. He never had to hire more than one person a year. Miss Conway swept into the office and handed Harry the folder. "'Thanks,' he muttered. "'Don't mention it, boss.' Harry called after her as she went back toward the reception room. "'Stay at your desk, will you? The government may need you.' A muffled giggle was her only response. Miss Conway was a civil service employee. She had been Harry's secretary for six months. Like most other civil service personnel, According to Harry's way of thinking, she was a tower of inefficiency. His chief annoyance stemmed from the fact that the Army had arbitrarily placed her in his office. He had been given no choice in the matter. It was one hell of a way to treat a personnel director, he thought. He sat at his desk, gloomily aware of the headaches he'd have to face in his quest for George Fisher's replacement. He opened the folder and glanced at the vital statistics. Fisher, George, age 40, weight 160, height 5 foot 9, eyes green, hair none, complexion light, date of employment 10758, date of departure 41259. 
Reason, suicide, etc., etc. Harry yawned. Statistics bored him. He turned to a page marked Qualifications and started reading. The phrase, Education and Experience in Nuclear Physics Required, caught his eye. The requirement was no surprise to him, but whenever he saw it, he took a few minutes off to indulge his curiosity. What was the big project at weapons development? He loved to know. He couldn't find out, of course. And the inability to find out naturally gave his imagination the widest latitude. His most persistent theory involved an atomic-powered rocket capable of knocking the Russians' manned satellites out of space. The Russians were still ahead of everyone, and their latest satellites were heavily armed. As usual, they were lording it over the rest of the world, and the rest of the world had not come up with an effective answer to this challenge. Harry closed the folder. He glanced at a list of technical schools. He would call each of them and ask them to submit a list of lab technicians. He would also look over the field of technicians still left in private enterprise. The intercom buzzed. What is it, Miss Conway? Miss Ralston is here. Who is Miss Ralston? She has an appointment with you. An appointment? Harry was baffled. Who made it? I did. I guess I forgot to tell you. Harry closed his eyes and counted to ten. Thank you, Miss Conway. Will you step into my office for a moment? He tried to control his mounting anger. She breezed into the office. Now, Miss Conway, will you please tell me who is this Miss Ralston? She operates Ralston Personnel Consultants. I think she wants to talk to you about the replacement for George Fisher. Uh, you know, the one who died? Yes, yes, I know. And you know, Miss Conway, we don't do business through agencies. Oh, Miss Ralston doesn't run an agency. She told me. Her business is much more exclusive than that. She handles very highly specialized people. That's the reason why I know. That's why you gave her an appointment with me, said the exasperated personnel director. Well, you can go right back out and tell her I've canceled the appointment. This is a security job we're filling, and— Before Harry could utter another syllable, his attention was drawn to the doorway. The view to the outer office was blocked by a bundle of curves. The most alluring female bombshell his eyes had ever beheld put everything important out of his mind. "'I didn't realize you were being so inconvenienced, Mr. Payne. I'm terribly sorry.' Her eyes drooped. "'I can take my business elsewhere.' Miss Ralston's voice was just above a half-whisper. The words came out warm and intoxicating. "'No, wait, wait a minute, Miss Ralston.' Harry was out of his chair and at the door. He took her arm. Who said anything about inconvenience? Come in, come in. That'll be all, Miss Conway. Thanks. The secretary giggled and left. Miss Ralston sat down and lit a cigarette. Harry noticed she was wearing a beige knit suit with a neckline that spoke volumes. Each curve was in the right place. Every movement had another movement all its own. Harry knew she was bound to talk business, and he knew there wasn't much he could do for her in that direction. But at thirty-five and eligible, he just couldn't let this woman leave his office. Harry Payne was a sucker for a gorgeous face. He knew it, and he knew the gorgeous face knew it. Tell me, Miss Ralston, when did my secretary arrange this appointment for you? I called yesterday. Harry arched his eyebrows and smiled. Yesterday, what prompted you to call me? You're looking for a laboratory technician, aren't you? What gave you that idea? He asked, not caring in the slightest what gave it to her. I make it my business to comb the papers every day, Mr. Payne. I came across the news of George Fisher's suicide and called you. Simple as that. You don't waste any time. She smiled and pursed her lips. Do you? I try not to. 
I have seven clients who would qualify for the job. I'd appreciate it if you'd see them. Well, as a matter of fact, Miss Ralston, she leaned forward with an inquisitive, Yes? Harry cleared his throat. As a matter of fact, I'm not supposed to do business with civilian agencies. Mr. Payne, she smiled demurely, do I look like an agency, or do I look like a personnel consultant? Now there was an opening, Harry thought, but it might be best to avoid it. You're working to get someone a job. It amounts to the same thing. I see. Then how do you go about hiring your new personnel? I do the soliciting myself. Sorry, Miss Ralston, but I don't make the rules and regulations. But the lady was undeterred. She crossed her legs and sank further into the easy chair. Her eyes sparkled at Harry. These clients of mine are all top men, Mr. Payne. Why couldn't I just leave you their names? You can still do the soliciting. I'd be happy to forego my regular commission on this job. Call it the value of prestige. Harry recognized another opening, and this time plunged in. Suppose we talk it over later. There's a place at Fourth Avenue and Woodward called Maria's. Best Italian food in captivity. I'm through at five. What about you? She didn't have to say anything. Her eyes told him he would be having an Italian dinner that night. And not alone. She rose and walked in front of his desk. I'm so glad we have something in common, Mr. Payne. I can't think well on an empty stomach either. After walking her to the outer office, he came back to his desk. He took a deep breath and loosened his tie. Dreams like Miss Ralston didn't materialize every day. For a first meeting, he figured he hadn't fared too badly at all. And if this first date went well, he was sure he'd be seeing a lot of this girl. It did not escape Harry's mind that here was a girl who was in the habit of getting what she wanted. But why not? Her powers of persuasion were grade A. They were so good they presented him with one big problem. He had regulations, army regulations. He couldn't violate them. Miss Ralston, it was obvious, was going to meet him solely for the purpose of getting a client a job. Would he be able to see her again after she knew he had no intention of hiring that client? The following morning, Harry entered the office to find his secretary unusually busy. She was pecking away furiously at the typewriter. He handed her a sheet of paper and said, Miss Conway, copy these names and addresses, and when they... When they come in, you'll see them at half-hour intervals. She smiled benignly. Miss Ralston just called and told me. Pretty smart chick, huh, boss? Harry did a slow burn and ambled into his office. Miss Conway was right, of course, and that's what annoyed him. It had been quite a night. He whined and dined her. They did all the bright spots, and, wonder of wonders, on the first date they wound up at Paula Ralston's apartment. She was a captivating hostess, an exquisite dancer, and something of a sorceress. After one kiss, an unforgettable one, Harry had agreed to interview her seven clients. But all this was last night, Harry reminded himself. Today was a different matter. He was in the sanctity of his office now, and capable of clearer thinking. Paula Ralston had accomplished the first phase of her mission. The next move was his. Seeing the clients, he rationalized, was not violating the regulations, and for the moment it satisfied her. She certainly was a determined girl. Anyone would think, watching her operate, that a lab technician was a job of world-shaking importance. What the hell, he shrugged. If the girl didn't look out for her own interests, she wouldn't have a successful business. There's only one way to keep clients happy, and that's to keep them busy. Besides, her maneuvering wasn't going to work anyway. He just couldn't hire any of them. 
His problem now was to stall her for a couple of days so he could keep seeing her. In the end he might possibly tell her the army had refused to accept any of them. He glanced out the window and saw the weapons development center across the parade ground. Business appeared to be going on as usual. Routine, quiet, cautious. High time I started thinking seriously about that replacement, he thought. There was a knock at the door. Come in. Miss Conway bounced in. They started to arrive. The first one is Mr. Thompson. Okay, let's get started. Send him in. Thompson was a small, roundish man in his mid-forties. He remained quite at ease during the interview. Harry began the session in the usual dull manner, formulating his questions from the several sheets of information Mr. Thompson had brought with him. It wasn't long before Harry detected something unusual about the man, but he couldn't determine what it was. He became more alert, more interested as the interview progressed. Where are you from originally, Mr. Thompson? Chicago. Oh, yes. He glanced at the written information. I see you went to the university. Yes, sir. My practical experience is documented on the second sheet. What was it about this guy? He was overly polite, but that could hardly be considered strange. His answers were brief, to the point, even curt. That was just a personality trait, Harry supposed. Couldn't condemn a man for that. How long did you live in Chicago? Twenty-one years, sir. Are you married? No, sir. He had noted before that Mr. Thompson had a distracting habit of patting his hair. Now he knew why. He was wearing a toupee. Harry wondered if the poor guy was sensitive about it. If he was that conscious of it, it might account for his strange attitude. Thank you for coming in, Mr. Thompson. I'll submit your papers to Colonel Waters. If he has any further interest in you, don't be surprised if you receive a visit from a couple of intelligence agents. That's routine for this job. I just tell you in advance so you won't worry. I understand, he said rising and checking his toupee once more. Many thanks to you, sir. He shook Harry's hand and left the room. Harry glanced at the papers again. Mr. Thompson's background was impressive indeed. There didn't seem to be much question as to his ability, but what a queer duck he was. The second applicant was a short, wiry man named Chase. Like his predecessor, he was brief and to the point with his answers, he let his qualification papers speak for themselves. He was formal and polite. Midway through the interview, Harry noticed that he too was wearing a toupee. If that wasn't the damnedest coincidence! Fortunately, Mr. Chase didn't have the annoying habit of patting his head every thirty seconds. Harry guessed he either had a more expensive one, or was just endowed with more confidence that it would not slip off. The interview over, Mr. Chase offered his thanks and strolled out. Harry had a few moments to himself before Paula's third client arrived. He thought about the first two men. Funny thing about toupees. Even the most expensive ones could always be detected. He couldn't quite understand why the two men wore them. They were often used by playboys, actors, self-styled over-age Romeos, people whose niche in society depends upon their looks. But not scientists or technicians. In fact, Harry couldn't remember ever having known one such person who shunned his baldness in this manner. That didn't mean they had no right, but it did seem peculiar as hell. By the time the third interview was over, Harry Payne's curiosity was ablaze. Applicant number three, Mr. Bowles, was not only wearing a toupee, but had gone one step further. Just north of his mouth there was a mustache, a good-looking mustache, well-groomed and shaped, but phony as a wax banana. For a moment he thought Paula Ralston might be perpetrating a joke of elaborate proportions. He rejected the idea as fast as it came to him. He didn't know the girl very well yet but he knew her well enough to know she was strictly business. She wanted one of these men to get that job. 
He flipped the intercom button for Miss Conway. She might be able to tell him indirectly. You wanted to see me, Mr. Payne? Yes, Miss Conway. The three men who've already been in here, have you noticed anything strange about them? Her eyebrows merged in spelled perplexity. She pursed her lips and gave the matter the gravest consideration. Then she concluded, Yes, something very strange. Harry was hopeful. What was it? None of them did very much talking. Strictly anti-social types. Harry groaned, realizing he should have known better. Thank you, Miss Conway. That's all. The fourth guy is waiting outside. Let him sit for a couple of minutes, then send him in. He decided to put the whole matter out of his mind and get the interviews over as fast as possible. There were other, more serious duties to attend to. The toupee episode was probably nothing more than a crazy coincidence anyway. Strictly an item for believe it or not. By two o'clock that afternoon, the four remaining candidates had come and gone, and Harry Payne sat at his desk in the immediate aftermath questioning his sanity. All seven men wore toupees. It was incredible, but true. And now the matter was one of deep and abiding concern to him. There was nothing funny about it. There was a touch of the macabre in it that rendered his flesh cold and weak. He lit a cigarette and tried to pull his thoughts together. Seven men applying for the same job. Seven men with one thing in common. Seven men as bald as Dr. Cyclops. Harry had to abandon the notion that sheer coincidence brought these men together. That was too fantastic. They were brought together by design. Their backgrounds varied in that they had all worked and come from different parts of the country, but those facts were only on paper. It was an odds-on bet they all knew each other. There was even something about the order in which they arrived in the office that indicated a pattern or an overall plan. Numbers three, five, and six had worn false mustaches. If it was true that the seven men were well acquainted, then Paula Ralston could undoubtedly give him some answers. Harry had another dinner engagement with her at five o'clock, but this date, he told himself, would be different. He was going to be all business until he learned exactly what she was involved in. He picked up the phone, got an outside line, and dialed. Frank Barnes was a private detective. A good one. Harry was sure he could rely on him for a small favor. A subdued, resonant voice answered on the other end. Frank, Harry Payne here. Harry, where you been hiding? I need a favor. The only time you ever call me, you ingrate. There's a dame called Paula Ralston, runs a business called Ralston Personnel Consultants. How soon can you get anything on her? How soon do you need it? Today, if possible, you can call me at home any hour. After promising Frank to meet him for lunch one day, Harry sank into an easy chair and tried to shake the unnerving effect the seven men had had on him. Maybe he shouldn't have called Frank. This might be something he should have informed the army about. No, they'd want to know what business he had seeing the seven men in the first place. He didn't have much of an answer for that one. Driving along Woodward Street toward Fourth Avenue, Harry was beset with one nagging question. Why had Paula Ralston never brought any of her clients to see him before? He was the dispenser of over a hundred good jobs that offered high salaries. The answer was just as persistent as the question. Lab technician was the only security job he handled. She was determined that one of her men get that job at any cost. It wasn't a very pleasant thought. Harry didn't want to believe it. He didn't want to believe that Paula Ralston was going to mean trouble for him, and yet he knew that's exactly what she meant. She was waiting for him at Maria's. She kissed him as he slipped into the booth beside her. Through four drinks and a six-course dinner, 
he watched her smile. That smile could melt down the door of a bank vault. He noticed how she laughed at all his wisecracks. When it was her turn to talk, she talked about him. She offered a toast to their closer friendship, with special emphasis on the word closer. But she did not mention the seven men. That was the smart approach, Harry ventured. She'd save that until she got home and slipped into something more comfortable. He stood alone in Paula's living room, nursing a scotch on the rocks. The night before he had been too concerned about his progress with this latter-day Aphrodite to give a damn about the place she lived in. He glanced around the room. Every inch reeked of success. The furniture was sleek, modern, exquisitely contoured, like its owner. There wasn't much question about it. Paula Ralston made a lot more dough than he did. But how? That was the question. She came out of the bedroom and mixed herself a drink. She was a living dream in a black lace negligee. Transparent. It figured. A lot of things were beginning to figure. Shall I tell you a secret? she asked. I didn't think you had any left. He couldn't take his eyes from the negligee. I think Mr. Chase and Mr. Bowles are the best of the seven. I think they come closest to what you're looking for. She lifted her glass and clinked it against his. Harry smiled. He wasn't looking at her any more. It was more of an education to look through her. She was good, damn good. She could lull you into believing the Grand Canyon was brimming over with silver dollars all yours for the taking. It was next to impossible to doubt the sincerity in her face. I liked all seven of them, he said. But since you know them better than I do, I'll take your recommendation that Chase and Bowles are the best. She moved closer to him. He could feel the warmth of her body. We're making some progress, Harry. We've narrowed the field down to two candidates. Harry kept her maneuvering. Paula, I'm still faced with the problem of finding a way around the regulations. I can't hire either one of them until I solve that. Nothing stopped this girl. Nothing even slowed her down. She moved still closer to him. There's a way around everything, if a man has the right incentive to look for it. He knew what the right incentive was. He didn't have to go looking for that. He laid his drink down, put his arms around her, and kissed her. They walked to the sofa. Paula stayed close to him, the ever-thoughtful, loving female companion. She rubbed his back and neck and sprinkled him with soft, moist kisses. She never mentioned her clients again. And Harry promised to hire one of them the following day. He was anxious to get back to his apartment to find out if Frank Barnes had called. As he drove back along Woodward Street, he couldn't put Paula out of his mind. He already had her character pegged. But what was she up to? What was her goal? She wasn't doing all this for a lousy commission. The stakes were bigger than that. In a way, it was too bad she was going to have to settle for less than she bargained for. If her seven clients hadn't been so phony, she might have gotten away with it. But why was it necessary for them to be phony? Why should a girl, as shrewd as Paula, send seven men in disguise to see... Disguise! Somehow that word threw a different light on the matter. The men had all been disguised in places where hair should grow. They were not bald. There was something abnormal about them. And Harry was ninety percent certain what it was. The answer was incredible. There was still a ten percent margin for error. For Miss Paula Ralston's sake, he hoped he was wrong. End of the Observers, Part 1